Good evening, everyone. Let's find your seats. Good to see everybody here out tonight. It's get, starting to get a little bit nippy. Some of you like that. I don't. That's when I start singing the Mamas and the Papas song, California Dreaming. You know, so it's going to be a long song. It's going to be a long time. We're back in Nehemiah. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 10 this evening. Haven't been there in a while. Been so busy with other Wednesdays and things going on here. So it's good to be back in the Old Testament. As you're turning there, if, if, you, if you or you know of any families that are struggling this year to, to get gifts for their family, if that's how you celebrate Christmas or to put food on the table, please let us know. Let me know. The elders know, Matt, staff, let us know and uh, so we can help in that area because we know how it is these days. So uh, we just want to help. And plus we have families that are asking and they want to help as well. So that's always a blessing. So we're just going to put it out there. So, and I'll probably repeat this on Sunday as well. Uh, but if uh, you know someone or you yourself or one who needs to put food on your table or get a few gifts for the kids and so on, no, let us know. You know, I know some people who love to go shopping. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I love Pastor Chuck. Uh, we were, as I said before, we were blessed to sit under him for five years. And every year, he'd, in the back room, there'd be bicycles and baby dolls and G.I. Joes. And, and he loved to go shopping, I think. And he'd had families who were hurting to go back there and shop. And uh, it was just a blessing, man. So we want to kind of do that too. But uh, I'll just send them out to shop for you. But anyway, Father, thank you, God, for gathering us here this evening. And we ask that you settle our hearts, God, as we look to your word, Father, and uh, in the Old Testament, Lord. And we're, we come, Lord, we want to glean, and, but we also want to apply. Lord, please give us... Give us a word, God, tonight. Give us a, a point, an application, Lord, something that we can take home tonight, God, that it will apply to our lives today. We know this is your precious word, Lord, so we believe that you'll speak to us that way, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. And everyone set. Amen. Well, we've got to review a bit because we've been out of the book of Nehemiah uh, at least three weeks, I think, if not more, and... So far, we've learned, if we remember from chapter 8, when Ezra, that beautiful chapter, when Ezra brought out the scroll. You know, it was just a wonderful time that people were blown away as he brings out the the scroll, the the law of God, the, the book of Moses, the law of Moses. And he opened it. So not only did he bring it out, then he opens it. And not only did he open it, he read from it. Remember that? He read and the people were just cut, man. They were just hearing God's word. They appreciated it so much more that they, that they stood for hours listening to Ezra and, and perhaps some of the other priests, you know, just reading it. Uh, as a matter of fact, Nehemiah 8, 8 says, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense not only did they read it, but they gave the sense. What, what is being said here? And helped them, he says, to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. You see, guys, anytime you open this word and you believe that it is God's word, It is holy unto the Lord. It is an awesome privilege for us to read the word of God, to open it, and to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, speak to me this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Speak to me. This is holy. We believe it is God's word. And Nehemiah said, this day is holy to the Lord your God, because they were mourning and they were weeping. They were cut to the heart. He says, do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord, of the law. Isn't that awesome? You got to think back to when you first got saved. You got to think back to when someone first gave you a Bible. You went out to buy a Bible. 
and you begin to read it. And a little tear, where, you know, a little motion hit, hit us because we have God's word in our hands. The reading and the understanding of God's word. You know, this is where we get Bible study from. This is where, what we take from when he taught over a lectern, when he taught over a, a podium, and he opened it, and he gave the sense, and he gave the application. And as you remember, when we studied it, as God's word was, was brought forth, it, it began a nationwide, Israel, nationwide revival, a revival. And then we got into chapter 9, in chapter 9, we saw a nationwide repentance and, and, and rededication, which culminated in a, in, in a written covenant, if you remember the last time we were together, and a, a written covenant uh, of promise to keep what they were reading, to keep what they were reading in the Word of God, in the law of Moses. Not only is, was it precious just to read it and to hear God's Word and for the for the priests to give the sense of it, but then they realized we need, we need to obey it. We, we need to obey what we're reading in this, in this repentance of, of them just, you know, neglecting the things that God had for them to do and, and commanded them to do. They wanted to honor him. And there's no greater honor in honoring God than in obedience. Nehemiah 9.38 says, and because of all of this, that is all of what we read in chapter 9, how, how they reviewed, uh, and this was humbling, they reviewed their backsliding, how they did backslide against God, how they did not uh, put their heart to what God wanted them to do. He says, and all of this, and, and, and not only their backsliding, but they also spoke in chapter 9, God's blessing, and they des- and they deserved the deserved chastisement. He says, and because of all of that, we, the nation, Israel, make a sure covenant and write it. And our leaders and our Levites and our priests seal it. And that's where we left last time. And it is here in chapter 10 where we begin to see the sealing of that covenant. It says in, in, in verse 1, now those who place their seal on the document were, and it begins with Nehemiah, the governor. You see that? The document was ratified and sealed by these people, but we're not going to read all their names for you. Uh, They mean nothing to us, but they mean everything to God. But for us, I wouldn't bore you with that or mess all the names up as we've done in the past, but I do want you to see that Nehemiah is the first on that list. He's the first to affix a wax seal. He's the first to seal a, a document which was an equivalent to the, for, for one's signature at that time. He was the first. And the reason why he was being the first is because he was the leader. And leaders lead. And they lead from the front. They don't lead from the middle or the back. They check on the middle. They go to the back. How are you doing? What's going on? But they're always leading from the front. It, it, you know, if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to accept the calling of being a leader, God will equip you. But you've got to remember, you've got to lead. You've got to lead up front. And so this list begins with Nehemiah, who again set an excellent example for the people leading from the front. Then notice the next were the priests. And after them, the Levites. And then the other leaders followed suit. And they're learning that we've got to be up front. We've, we've got to protect. We've got to protect these people. We've got to lead them, watch over them. This is what we've been called to do. And they took it serious. And he was right there, man. I'm going to seal it first. This is my seal. We've taken this, this oath. We've taken this oath unto God. So we pick it back up in verse 28. That was quick, wasn't it? With the 28 verses already, man. Verse 28 says, Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, anyone old enough to understand, decipher 
to understand what was written, excuse me, what was read and, and explained. Verse 29, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a, a curse and an oath. Check that out. They entered into a curse and an oath to what? To walk in God's law, which was given to Moses by the servant of God. Can you imagine, guys, you have that book on your laps right now or in your hand. You have those same words. Of course, they were in Hebrew then. And thank God somebody, you know, transcribed them and into English. But um, you have that same, that this, this same book that they're, they're taking an oath on. To, and he says to, to walk in them, the, the, the law, the Bible, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes in making the covenant. They agreed to accept a curse from God if they did not obey his law. Kind of strange wording there, huh? They took an oath of obedience, and they said, we will accept uh, a curse as as a form of correction if they strayed from their oath. Because they already came out of a corrective uh, pattern. They already came out of a correction from God when when God had them to be uh, taken captive. Uh, And we'll talk a little bit more of that here in a minute. So they say, we're going to accept that. But what, really what they're saying is we're going to be obedient. We're going to be obedient. And obedience should follow true repentance. And when I was studying this, again, I, I, I always go back to the loveless church in Revelation. I always think back to that when I'm bringing application. So, Lord, what does this speak to me personally, first and foremost? And then, Lord, what is, how, how does this, what we're reading in the Old Testament, apply to the church today? And I, I always use it, but he always brings me back to Revelation, to that loveless church. And now Jesus told them that they had to, well, that, that they had left, I should say. They had left their first love. And who was their first love? It was, it was the one who was writing and telling them that they had left their first love. It was him. If you re- re- remember that church there in Ephesus, they, it says you, you, you do so many works. You do some great work and you have some, some you know, uh, uh, just, just great things you're doing there. And, you know, there's the commendation, but then there's the, the well, what we would say, the condemnation. And the condemnation was they did all these things but they didn't have the right heart. They had forgotten Jesus. They had forgotten why they're doing these things. They had forgotten their relationship with the Lord. He says, you have left your first love. It's so Revelation 2, 5, uh, we, we use this a lot again, and, and, and he gives them the prescription to get their heart right back with them. And what is the prescription? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, And do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from this place unless you repent. Obedience should follow true repentance. And this was true for these folks as they heard the word of God, as they were cut to the heart, as they were weeping and even into a time of mourning and sacrifice and uh, abstaining from food, uh, that they had to realize that the response to this is, is, is good at what we're doing, but as Nehemiah says, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's obedience. It's following through. It's, it's doing what the Word of God says. So you have revival in chapter 8, repentance in 9, then you have renewal or obedience, and that by a new commitment, and this is what they're committed to. They're going to We're going to take this oath, and and I'll I'll give you the oath commitments here in a minute, but but they're they're willing to put their their name on the line and say, God, if we don't, which would they have any any choice anyway, we'll accept the curse. We'll accept the the correction from you. And so uh, pretty heavy. Moving on to verse 30, he goes on to say that... um, they go on to give the oath commitments. This is what they're committing to. Number one, marital relational commitment. Marital relational commitment. Notice it says in verse 30, 
We would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, which tells us what? That they did do that. They got so far away from God's word, even after coming back, that they were given their wives, their daughters as wives to the peoples of the land. The peoples of the land were the Gentiles, the the non-Jews. He says, nor take their daughters for our sons, which tells us they were doing the same thing. Now, God strictly pro- forbidden that, for- forbade that. And, and this was a commit- commitment here addressed directly to the parents at that time. And, and we could even say for this time, but, but we're there at that day, and that time, the parents are the ones that would partner up their kids, right? There's some interesting series on television, if you ever watch them, and how they're pairing. Uh, some people are still trying to do that. Some parents are, and we should, don't get me wrong, we should be involved, but the point there is there where the parents take, take all the, no, you're going to marry this guy, or you're going to marry this gal, and, ah, you know, you know Frankenstein, and uh, I don't want to marry Frankenstein, and, 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 you know, and you have no choice. So this was a commitment addressed directly to the parents of whom in that day were responsible for the marital decisions of their children. And you say, well, why? Because God clearly stated in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and in other places, because if they do this, if they even start to, uh, you know, date, if they even start to, you know, hang out with, with, with those who are not uh, 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 of Israel, he says, they will turn your sons away from following me. God knew that was so important to follow God. He says, you know what? Parents, if you start mingling your children with the nations, the godless nations who aren't following me, this is what's going to take place. You will, t- you will, but they will turn your sons, they, those who, who are of, uh, not of the tribe, not of the Israel, they will turn your sons away from following me. And when that happens, we turn to serve other gods. And this angered the Lord. It angered him when he saw the families allowing their sons and daughters to marry those who were godless, those who were pagan. He says, this can't be. Now today, that responsibility no doubt lands upon the adult children. And we sh- I think we should have a, parents should have some say in it, but you, you, parents know, you know. You know sometimes that can be good, and sometimes that can be not so good. And so, uh, but it, it, it lands upon the adult children. So let me talk to the singles here. Then be adult. Be adult about it. And, and if you're a believer, then be in the word of God. I'm going to, I'm going to say something else, too, some more things here. But if you say, well, I'm, I'm old enough to make my own decisions. I don't need my mom and dad. Then, then be that adult then. God has given us the direction on how to do that. And that is through his word. As believers, let me remind you that we should never find our hearts being drawn to those who are not born again. And I want to say specifically born again. Because there's so many people who say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. And we talked about that on Sunday, right? Who else believes in God? <laughs> Some of you are dating Satan himself. You, know, you got to get out of there. But, yeah. So I'm very specific to what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You have got to be born again. Totally redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And understand what that means. Understand, maybe this is just the father speaking not in me, but I'm trying to be a shepherd up here. And I know I'm speaking not much to the, I'm speaking, how does it say, to the choir, but I know there are maybe some here that are, want to be married and they're single and those who are watching at home. And, and we can encourage one another as parents and, and as believers, but don't let your heart be drawn to those who are not born again. Scripture is very clear on this. It's very clear. You know what, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be what? Unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. And please, don't play that card where we think, guys, I'm just telling you from experience as a shepherd, 
behind or a shepherd in counseling sessions. Don't, don't, don't be led astray in this. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't think, well, I can change her. I, 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 can, I can take him to the cross. And, and I'm sure there was one or two times where someone was able to do that. But let me tell you, if they can get up here and give a testimony tonight of what I'm saying and say, amen, pastor, preach it. I'm sure they would, but I'm not going to let them do that. For what fellowship has righteousness with law? You can't get any clearer than this. And Paul is writing here, and all he has at this point is the Old Testament, and he's taking what we just referenced, and he's applying it for the church today and the believers. And and what communion has light with darkness? It's very clear. But we have loved ones out there who, yeah, yeah, Dad, I see that. Yeah, Mom, I see that. But but this is different. This no. No, it's not. So those who are single and want to be married, praise God for that. But you must first vow unto God. You must vow unto him before the altar, before the ceremony of marriage. You must vow unto God before you say, I do, and make sure you don't marry an unbeliever. You have to ask questions. Do they attend a church? I had one person who was counseling one person, and I asked that, do you attend church? Yeah, what's your pastor's name? Uh, uh, I think it starts with a Joe or... uh, I said, Lord Jesus, have mercy. (laughs) Do they attend the church? Are they active in the church? Anybody can join a church. Just because you walk into here doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you go to a donut shop don't make you a what? I didn't say it. You guys said it. By the way, if you didn't hear it, they said cop. And um, that's bad, you guys. Don't do that. They protect us. Are they active in church? And as I put it here, do they know the pastors or the elders? Oh, that's that guy up there. That's my pastor up there. What's his name? Uh, uh, who's their elders? Well, uh, you know. Uh, are they in the word of God? More? Are they in the word? If, if, if they are a male, are they able to read the word of God and explain the word. Now, I'm not saying they have to be scholars. I'm not, you know, they have to do the, you know, go into Bible college, they have a degree. And, but, but do they really know the word of God? Do they have a, a testimony? I'm not gonna expound on that because that's one of the things I use. What's your testimony? My what? Your testimony. Do they have a testimony? Do they lead you in prayer? Do they have a desire to lead you in prayer or a desire to pray with you? Don't be unequally yoked. Let me just bring a warning out there. You are an adult, then be an adult. But be an adult believer. Be in the word of God. You know, you'll make your parents very happy in that. You'll make... You make us very happy to know. Now, we're not looking at perfection. There's still, you know, the, uh, the beginning and, and the learning and the bills and the babies come and all that great stuff. It's all good stuff, man. But when you're together, when Jesus Christ is the center of your marriage, when you're both trying to figure it out, man, you have the Lord, man, it's beautiful, man. It really is. So anyway, little little application there. But that was one of the oath. Commitments, marital relationship commitment. I will not allow my son or my daughter to be involved in an unequally relationship with the nations, with those who have nothing to do with Yahweh, nothing to do with our God. And today, nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with, with him or her. Secondly, they, uh, they kept the Sabbath holy. Look at verse 31. 
If the peoples of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we would not buy it, which tells me they were doing that. And uh, uh, from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. In other words, they would keep the whole of the Sabbath, its entire obligation of what God had written into work week to week and every seventh year as holy unto the Lord as they should have. As they, as they should have. This was one of the main reasons for the nation being led into captivity because they did not. And, and they're confessing it here. This is one of the commitments. God says keep the, the Sabbath day holy. We're going to keep it holy. We're going to obey God's word. Because they disobeyed God's command in allowing the land to lay fallow every seventh year. And in the sixth year before the seventh, God would provide for them to get through the Sabbath year. But they did not trust God. They did not put their faith in the fact that, man, if we don't go out there and plant seed, if we don't go out there and turn the soil over, what are we going to eat in the seventh day? God said, I'm going to provide for you. They didn't trust God. And plus... What are we going to sell in the marketplace? How are we going to make a living? How? I'm going to take care of you. But they didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. They put their business and finances first before God. They put their stomachs first before God. And they did this for 70 Sabbath years. And guess what? God wanted them back. And that was their sentence for their disobedience. Spending 70 years in captivity. Today, what about the Sabbath today? Sabbath keeping is not mandated upon the church nor the Christian. It's very clear, Colossians 2, 16. Let, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. For, and verse 17, which are the shadow, right? Underline that, the shadow of things to come. We're looking at that in Hebrews. And who was the substance? Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. So very clear. We make it so hard on ourselves. So very, we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 8, in Mark 2, 28, and in Luke 6, 5, very clearly, he or I am the Lord of what? I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the fulfillment. As our Savior, we find our rest and peace in him. Jesus is God's plan for us to cease from the labor of our own works, to rest from striving for redemption. He's done all the work. And then we receive him, and he becomes our rest. Now, if you personally want to keep a Sabbath, if, you know, uh, I just, we're just with a group of pastors, and one of them is going on a sabbatical. I don't know if that's where we get that word Sabbath. And then he's going to go on a sabbatical. Two months, by the way. I get two days. But anyway, uh, but that's fine. It, you know, some of the guys, they, 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 they take the time of Sabbath. They don't, they don't truly do a Sabbath because uh, it just doesn't work, you know, here. But, but don't put that on nobody else. You guys ran into them. You know who they are. You know, they're, they're so legalistic, right? And they're not even doing it right. Look, we don't have to worry about that. We can keep from striving and, and trying to keep a Sabbath. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden. And what? I'm going to give you rest. And take my yoke upon you, man, and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And anything they could try to get Jesus in, in the gospels, freedom was on the Sabbath. And Jesus was radical, wasn't he? He would do things on the Sabbath and then come back. I'm in Matthew now, and he'd come back with so, so, so much wisdom and so much richness and why he was doing it. And, and how many would, would you break the Sabbath to get your cow out of a gully? And here I am going to heal this man who's made in the image of God, who's in need and you're coming against me? Well, the Sabbath was one, that was one of the key things. They, they, they were done with Jesus. I'm done. We're going to murder this guy. We're going to get rid of him. Now, don't get caught up in that. 
Now, the New Testament biblical rest does not mean inactivity or laziness or lack of intensity, you know, but, but we can focus our service for the Lord in the important and eternal works on earth. Do we need to go away for a while and pray? Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that. Do, do we need to take a day where we just want to enjoy family and, and, you know, put worship music on? That's what we do in the living room, you know, put Greg Laurie on or Jack Hibbs or somebody and watch a good, another Bible study because they didn't get nothing out of my Bible study, but that's all right. I love them. But uh, watch, you know, uh, Ed Taylor or somebody. Okay, that's fine. You don't like me? I'm going to bed. Secondly, then they came out with these ordinances, notice, in verse 32. And so he says, so we, and notice the, the we, we, you know, what is that? Pronoun or? Help me with that. We, yeah. So we made ordinances for us, so they're all in this together. You know, what are ordinances here? Laws among themselves based upon the word of God, things they came up with themselves. Now they're being innovated. They're not adding to the scriptures, but they're taking what the law was and they're, and they're you know, just saying that these, these are the things that we're, we're, we're going to do ourselves and, and we're, we're going to, you know, keep these ordinances for ourselves. And the theme behind these ordinances, uh, the blessing, and we'll see this, is that they said, quote, we will not neglect the house of our God. Which tells me what they were, they had. You know, remember, it was in shambles. That's why Ezra came. Got word. You need to go. The house of our God is used nine times in this section as we end, as we close. Nine times. You think that's important? It's very important. And it refers to this restored temple that's built. Number one was a supporting tax, notice. So we made an ordinance for ourselves to exact from ourselves uh, a yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. So they would exact from each family one-third of a shekel. Now, what is a shekel? Uh, In in, in the gold market today, it would be $557. So just think about it. They would take $278 put it aside, and they will provide and give toward the house of our God. Uh, It would provide for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the set feasts, for the holy things, for the sin offering to make atonement for Israel, and all the work of the house of our God. This is above and beyond what they were required to give, and we'll get to that in the tithing aspect of it. We We want to do this. We're just excited, man. We just want to do this for the Lord. Next was a wood offering. A wood offering, and we think, well, what offering? What's that, man? It's so simple, but it was important. Verse thirty-four, and we cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God. I love the fact that they call it an offering unto the Lord, according to the Father's houses at the appointed times, year by year. The simplest things like wood, yet for such an important use. Such an important use. To burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We're going to put together. We're going to cast lots. And, and, and everyone will have their time when they'll bring the wood. The wood offering as they would call it. To keep that fire going. To help in the, in the offerings. To, to do worship. To honor God. Um, by the way, guys, just a little side note. As of December 5th, 2022, wood is worth now $392 and, uh, per 1,000 board feet. That may sound, it's gone down. It's gone down. Uh, I was sharing with my wife the, the graph. And uh, what is 1,000 board feet? It's one foot length of a board, one foot wide and one inch thick. So I just thought you guys wanted to know that. Start going back to Lowe's. Wives, kick him. Tell him, let's get this project going, man. Now the wood, you can't blame the wood. It's going down. You wouldn't believe how much it was before. But anyway, who cares about that? Moving on. The first fruits offering, verse 35. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord. 
to bring the firstborn of our sons, dedicating them in our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, Imagine just even the dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites. For the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. And this was all done in support of the priest's livelihood. We are going to bring these things. We're going to give forth our first fruits. They were so, they, they had become a people who, who, who kept back when God clearly says, no, that's not healthy. That's not, that's not holy. That's not right. You are to be a people who want to give. You are to people who want to, you know, provide. And, and who's going to provide for those who are at the temple, for the priests, uh, for, for, for their livelihood. And, and so they continue their duties at the temple and, and know that, that God would provide. And how does God provide? He provides through the people's joyful, generous uh, generosity and through their obedience to God's law. And then he talks about the tithing off the tithes. Look at verse 38. And the priests, the descendants of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. So that's good. That can be kind of sort of uh, keeping each other accountable. But the reason, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse for the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, the new wine and oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are. The singers, even the worship team? But anyway, where the priests who and ministers and the gatekeepers and the singers are and we will not neglect the house of our God and we will not neglect the house of of our God because they had neglected it for so many years. The Levites were to the tithe off the tithes they received to help provide for the priest's needs. And all this was the center point of their worship at that time. The center point of their worship was the temple. That was their worship center. That's where everything went on. On the outside was the offerings. The, The bleeding of the lambs as they were being offered unto the God. The, the, the blood, uh, the, the burning, the barbecue smell, if I may say. It was all the center, and they had lost that at one time. But now they're coming back, and they're making these ordinances. This is what we're going to do. We're going to honor God this way. Application for today, there's, there's not one center place or temple we are obligated to, but Jesus has made us the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the work of God goes on. And as God calls pastors and elders to minister to the people and those who call the gathering places of worship their church, we should also have a heart of support for God's work. And I say we. The New Testament patterns calls for us to invest in God's kingdom and gospel work joyfully, cheerfully, cheerfully and regularly through our tithes and our offerings and our time and our what? Our talents. Our time and talents. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. That's between you and the Lord. You lay something aside Storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. He didn't want to collect it to come. You guys do this ahead of time. And then he says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves what? God loves A cheerful giver. So, you know, as we give, man, we're just like, yeah, man, praise God. As we serve, praise the Lord, man, I get to serve. What a mop, give me the mop. Change a baby, give me a baby. Somebody give me a baby right now. Put him right here, we'll change him. You know, being joyful about it, being being loving about it, not being having a grudge. If, If we're 
given out of grudging, you know, grudgingly, if we're giving, then keep it, Taco Bell's down the street, spend it there. Or five guys, even better. Give you less heartburn. Sir Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. More importantly, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, what? That's right. There will your heart also. May we not forsake the house of our God. May we not forsake how God wants to use us in the gathering places that we call our church among other brethren as we look to one another and help one another and support one another. Amen? Father, obedience is such a sweet word, Lord. And a better action. When we have come from a place where we haven't been so unto you, Lord. Thank you for for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us time of repentance. And for some of us, maybe it's now time for obedience. We're so thankful that you greet, greet us back when we stray, God. We're so thankful that you pick us up when we fall. We're so thankful that you bless us when we deserve coal in our stockings. That you love us when we aren't so lovable, God, and there's times when we're not. But it's your love that leads us to repentance. Thank you, Savior. May we keep our eyes in your book, our eyes on you, our hearts close to you, God, as we walk this week out, Lord. Guide and direct us, we ask, in Jesus' precious name. Everyone said... God bless you guys.